At one o'clock on the 27th of June, 1879, Thomas Budge went to London to Windsor Castle to meet Queen Victoria, where he received a knighthood for designing the first railway bridge across the River Tay. His bridge had taken six years to build, a cost of 20 men's lives, some as young as 14 years old. 370 tons of cast iron, 870 cubic feet of timber, 15,000 casts, 10 million bricks and over 2 million rivets. The bridge cost £300,000. The North British Railway's directors crossed the bridge in a special train on the 26th of September 1877. The train was hauled with difficulty by a tiny green body locomotive called Lockheed. I'm here on the north side of the banks of the River Tay, that's next to the second railway bridge. It is nice to see that at long last we managed to get the memorial for the people who died in the Tay Bridge disaster. So well done to the Tay Bridge Memorial Disaster Fund. We have a memorial here on the north banks of the Tay and there is another memorial across at the other side of the bridge at Wormuth and the Taybridge Disaster Memorial Trust with guests unveiled the memorial on the 28th of December 2013 on the 134th anniversary and it was followed by a firework display. Looking at the names on the stones makes you wonder who they were. Driver David Mitchell had recently moved his family from Tayport to Dundee. He had three boys and two girls all under the age of 10. Driver David Mitchell had changed his Sunday shift as he had swapped with a colleague earlier in the year and this was him returning the favour. Fireman John Marshall was 24 and had been with the MBR for eight years. He was unmarried and because of this spent a lot of his spare time with the Mitchell family. There was a strong friendship between him and his driver. One of his prized possessions was a silver pocket watch which always kept accurate time, as it would for a real woman. He kept his watch wrapped in cotton waste in his breast pocket. Mr. William Henry Benyon, aged 39, was a very well-dressed man. He wore a diamond ring and a plain buckled ring and a Masonic scarf pin a valuable gold watch and had between 80 and 100 pounds in his pockets. He was a director of a fine art company in Cheltenham. Earlier he had been sitting in the refreshment room at Edinburgh Waverley with his business partner deciding who was going to Dundee for a business meeting. Mr. Benyon decided that he would go but when he reached Burn Island, he got on the wrong train. And it wasn't until he arrived into Ladybank, he heard the porter shouting, Per train, so he got off the train and waited for the Dundee train to arrive. When the Dundee train arrived, he joined the first class carriage, where he started to talk to fellow passenger Mr. William Linskill. He was travelling to St Andrews and had to change at Lucas. Mr. Benyon was telling him how he nearly missed the train had to change at Ladybank. When the train arrived in Toluca's, Mr. Linskill opened the window and asked the porter if his coach was waiting to take him to St. Andrews. The porter said no. Mr. Linskill was thinking he may have to travel to Dundee and continued chatting. But just before the train moved off, the porter chapped the window of his carriage, saying that the coach had arrived to take him to St Andrews. Mr Linskill departed the train, wishing Mr Binion a happy new year. Later, it was reported that this humble man, Mr Linskill, had wondered why God had saved him and not Mr Binion. John Scott, 
had traveled halfway around the world. He had just been discharged from his ship on Christmas Eve and was on his way back to Dundee with some silver dollars in his pockets. Schoolmaster David Nish from Lockheed had been visiting friends at Kirkcaldy, traveling with his daughter Bella, a lovely wee girl wearing her Sunday best and looking like a wee dolly. William MacDonald, 41, a sawmiller from Blackness Road in Dundee. He had taken his son David to see friends in Fife. He was a livin. He was wearing his Sunday tweed suit and a morning cap, as he had recently suffered a death in the family. His son was so excited to be travelling over the bridge a second time in one day, so made a point of sitting by the window so he could see the water as he travelled over the bridge. David Cunningham and Robert Fowlers had been on a weekend trip in Fife. They had been friends since childhood. They lived together in a boarding house in Dundee and there was very little they didn't do together. Robert Fowlers was, however, in love. There was a letter from his sweetheart in his pocket. Robert Watson was travelling with his two sons, David Nine and Robert Six. They had boarded the train at Cooper but Mrs. Watson didn't want him to travel to see friends in Fife because of the time of year, but her husband insisted as he didn't want to disappoint his boys. Robert Watson had four brothers, one of which was totally blind. He was a great support to his blind brother and was part of the Dundee Blind Institute. At Lucas, George Ness, 22, a young cleaner at Dundee Local Shed, had joined his friends Driver Mitchell and Farman Marshall on the footplate to travel to Dundee with the possibility of being dropped off at the local shed on the way into Dundee Station. George Johnson was waiting in heavy rain and wind at St Ford Station. He walked down the platform once the train arrived and tried to look through the steamy windows for his sweetheart, Elizabeth Smart. He had spent the day with his father, who works as a keeper in the St. Fort Estates. He found Elizabeth traveling in a third class compartment with a family member, Anne Cruikshanks. Anne Cruikshanks, 53, was a housemaid to Lady Baxter of Colmarn. Elizabeth was her niece, who also worked for her ladyship and was travelling to Brody Ferry to look after his sick friend and Elizabeth had been given a few days off and was looking forward so much to seeing the one she loved in life. They had planned to catch an earlier train but Lady Baxter's coachman had overslept so they missed the earlier train. In a second class carriage sat Archibald Bain. He was travelling with his sister Jessie a farmer from Balgay and a successful man in a modest way, with golden sovereigns in his pocket and a silver watch and chain on his waistcoat. His sister Jessie was a pretty girl and was admired by the boys round Balgay. She was much in love and had a letter in her pocket from the man she hoped to marry. She also had a letter to her father, telling him that she had been running late and was getting a later train. She had planned to post a letter to her father, but forgot. John Sharp, a joiner from Commercial Street in Dundee, sat alone in his compartment, tired. He had spent the day with friends in St Andrews. His friends tried to persuade him to stay the night, and John nearly agreed, but then decided to walk from St Andrews in the heavy rain and wind to catch the train. Walter Ness, returning from a visit to friends at Okhtermukti, was a foreman saddler and also a member of Dundee's Artillery Volunteers. As a retired senior railway manager who has over the years investigated many railway accidents and incidents, I find it hard to believe why this train was allowed to travel over the bridge in such a storm. Don't allow the train to travel over the bridge in such bad weather. The station staff at Dundee had been told earlier by the driver who had just travelled over the bridge that there is no way he would go back over that bridge not even for £500. This was not mentioned at the inquiry because 
the staff involved were not invited. We have to think of the culture of the railways back in 1879. If it's not safe, don't do it, wasn't part of working life back then. As we know, an inquiry on a disaster of this scale was unheard of back in 1879, and it seems the first Tay Bridge was doomed to fall, as the original design of the bridge had been changed so many times. The figure of 75, now 59, and some think even more, but if it happened on a weekday, the casualties could have doubled, even trebled. The passengers mentioned are just some who perished on the evening of the 28th of December 1879 on the Taybridge disaster. Now it was time to look for bodies. The following evening, the first body was found and it was eventually identified as Anne Cruikshanks. The Taybridge's first body and Dundee's first funeral on the first Thursday after the disaster, the people of Dundee lined the streets for her funeral and her coffin travelled back over the Tay to Fife, but this time by ferry. Time and more time. There were no more bodies found for days. Elizabeth, her niece and George were somewhere in the Tay dead, as was all the passengers and train crew. During the recovery process and looking for bodies, a lawyer arrived in Dundee, a Mr. Tweeney. He was acting on behalf of William Henry Baton's family. They were prepared to spend £20 to recover the fine art businessman's body. The railway companies, however, had laid £5 per body found. On the 31st of December, the locomotive was found within the high girders deep within the Tay and part of a carriage. Some bodies had been found, but when they were touched, they either sank or just floated away. On Monday the 5th, a body was spotted in the Tay. It was taken to Dundee Taybridge Station to the refreshment room, which is now a reception centre for the dead. It was the body of David Johnston the guard who had been travelling passenger in the brake van with the train guard. He was identified by his brother Andrew and David's watch in his uniform had stopped at 1916. On Tuesday the 6th of January four more bodies had been found. James Leslie, William Jack, James Crichton and Robert Watson. That day, there was a letter found on the beach by a child. The child took the letter home and it was read that it was from Jessie Bain to her father, saying that she'd be late home. But remember, the letter had never been posted. Robert Watson's four brothers came to the refreshment room at Dundee Taybridge Station, which had been turned into, as you remember, a reception centre for the dead. His blind brother ran his hand over his dead brother's face and wept. On Wednesday the 7th, more bodies had started to float to the surface. This was a suggestion from the whalers, as they stated when bodies start to decompose, they will rise to the surface. John Marshall, the fireman. His brother had been waiting for over a week. He had gone home, and John's badly burned body was eventually identified by Station Master Smith. William MacDonald, the sawmiller, was found and his silver watch was still in his pocket. David Nish, a Lockheed schoolmaster, John Sharp, confectioner from Dundee, William Tiffnell, 
and Walter Ness. Bodies were all found floating in the Tay. 8th of January, four more bodies found. Archie Bain, Thomas Davison, Alexander Robertson and James Henderson. Friday the 9th of January, David Watson, aged nine. He was still wearing his Sunday best clothes when he was found on a sandbank. William Peebles was found. He left a widow and eight children and his sister fainted when she saw the body. The whalers found the body of David MacDonald, age 11. His body was taken to the station the same day his father was being buried and he was identified by his uncle. George Johnson, the young man who was waiting for his sweetheart at St Ford Station, looking in the wind and rain for Elizabeth Smart, the niece of Anne Krugshanks. George's body was found on the 8th of January at 1340, below the fallen pier number three. It was suggested that the lovers only spent eight minutes together on the train. William Henry Bayon, a gentleman 39 years old, well dressed and on the train on the way to Dundee, but changed trains at Ladybank due to the fact he was on the wrong train. A gentleman businessman who had planned to travel to Dundee to speak to the North British Railways about some photographs he had taken, his body was found on the 7th of February at 7.55 a.m., 200 yards west of Newport Pier, near the shore. By the middle of the second week, 25 men, women and children's bodies had passed through the refreshment room, now a mortuary at Dundee Taybridge Station. Later, the bodies of David Cunningham and his close friend Robert Furless were recovered and eventually buried together in Kilmeny Kirkyard. Walter Ness, a 23-year-old foreman saddler who was found on the 7th of January and was part of the Dundee Artillery Volunteers, received a full military funeral. The guard of the train, David Macbeth, age 44, his body was found on the 13th of January, near the fallen Pier 3. By the end of January, 33 bodies had been removed from the Tay. On the 27th of January, at 11.50, near Wormut Bay, the small body of Bella Nish was found, age 4. That was a young daughter of David Nish. Bella now being the youngest victim of the Taybridge disaster. On the 18th of February, at 1 p.m., a body was found inside the girder near Pier 1. It was Jessie Bain, 22, the young lady from Balgay who had been travelling with her brother, Archie. On the 1st of March, near Green Scalp Bank, between Tayport and Broughty Ferry, the body of David Mitchell was found, our 37-year-old driver of the train, who left a wife and five children. David was buried in an unmarked grave until recently. Joseph Low Anderson was found on the 23rd of April. His body was found off the coast of Cake Ness. It was only the locomotive that survived the Taybridge disaster. There were several attempts to recover her, and at one point she sat on a sandbank at Dundee, where children used to be seen playing on her. Eventually she was taken to Curlier's by rail and repaired. She returned to service, but wasn't diagrammed on the Taybridge routes when the new bridge opened. It was said that drivers refused to travel on this locomotive over the new bridge. The local was given a name by drivers, they called it the Diver. But on the 28th of December, 1908, number 224, the Diver once again crossed the Tay by rail, as it what an anniversary train. The locomotive seems to have been scrapped sometime during the First World War. 
So we end the story about some of the people of the Taybridge disaster. But whatever happened to Elizabeth Smart? Remember, she was traveling with Anne Cruikshanks and met her fiancé, George Johnson, at St. Ford Station. Some history books suggest that Elizabeth Smart was planning to marry George in the first week of 1880. But she does go down in history as one of the bodies of the Taybridge disaster that was never found. Thank you.